praise the Lord, praise the Lord, amen. All right, this is what we're going to do tonight. I was enjoying singing those scripture songs. We're going to sing some scripture songs. We're going to do some choruses. We'll just have a, uh, 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 a time of, as we call it here, singing acapulco. Uh, but uh, so let's go ahead and get started in, um, I had it in my mind. Um, where? I don't know, and I had it in my mind, and then I just, I blanked. I'll think about that one. We'll get back to that one. Uh, let's start in uh, Matthew chapter number five. Matthew chapter five. There was a new one I was going to sing tonight, and I, I blanked on it. But uh, we're going to start in Matthew chapter number five. Amen. And get that. Matthew chapter, no, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter six. Verse number 33, let's all stand together. We'll sing a little bit here together. Matthew chapter number six. Uh, remember this from Sunday. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And then remember Matthew 7, 7 is the second verse of that. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Then the third verse is Matthew 4, 4. Matthew 4, 4. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go back to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Amen. Psalm 23. Let's do that verse 6. I know that's in our hymn book, but let's sing that chorus there. Uh, pretty familiar. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. See if you know this chorus, amen. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, he's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is he. Bow down before him, love and adore him. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. Go to 
a, that's the one, I remember it now. Joshua 1.8, Joshua 1.8. This is a good chorus. Joshua 1.8, amen. This is a great book, great verse in the Word of God. Joshua 1.8, and this is how it goes. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Pretty good, right? Let's do that one again. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Oh, I used to love singing that with the teenagers. Yeah, that's a good verse for teenagers right there. Amen. For all of us, but that's a good verse for teenagers. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Did I just sing that verse twice? I did, didn't I? I was supposed to be doing the cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. I like singing that with our son, and my wife will go, no, 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 no turning back. No, 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 no turning back. He likes that. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for your word. Lord, your word that can be a song, your word that can encourage us and lift us up, Lord. And I just pray now, Lord, that you would just help tonight in our service. Lord, I pray for those in our church that are sick. Pray for those that are traveling out of town. Pray for Brother Trey as he fills in and preaches tonight um, over at Canaan Baptist that you'd bless that service as well, and that you'd just be with us tonight, Lord. And I pray that you'd have your hand of mercy upon all that we do. We ask all of this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You all may be seated and uh, good to see everyone. I did want to let those know that are in the Institute, we will be having Institute tomorrow night. Uh, we will be here tomorrow night. Amen. And so um, be in your place. Uh, those that are in the Bible Institute, and we're enjoying that. Uh, just got started uh, with our second semester, but looking forward to what the Lord's going to do this semester in our Bible Institute. Um, as for Saturday going out we don't cancel uh but we will see what happens with the weather but uh we'll see we'll see what happens um even when we're not able to go out we'll stay here we'll spend some time in prayer and we'll we'll seek the lord's face and so we'll we'll see how the lord leads with all of that but don't 
We're not, we don't cancel until we just know we can't. Amen. And so um, we just don't know exactly how cold it's going to be this weekend for sure yet. Looking like it's going to be pretty cold, but this is the valley. And uh, um, there's always this thing that they put out there that shows the, shows the uh, what's that that comes out? The groundhog? And uh, um, they always put this thing um, out there where they have the groundhog and it says the groundhog saw a shadow six more weeks of winter. And then it shows the groundhog with his hand out going, except for you, Texas, you do your own thing. Uh, and that's about the truth out here. Amen. <laughs> and so uh, we'll see what, what happens this weekend. But um, no, no plans on canceling any services or anything like that. We're not looking at doing anything like that. So just... Go ahead and have it in your mind. We're going to do the things that we need to do this weekend. Uh, if Saturday we have to make an adjustment with weather, we'll, we'll let you know about that um, before it's time to go out. Amen. And so uh, let's go ahead. Let's turn tonight uh, to Psalm 23. I want to go to Psalm 23 tonight. There's a reason why certain passages of Scripture uh, are familiar. Uh, we Sometimes we hear different passages of Scripture, uh, and we've heard them many times, and they, they almost in our mind become like a cliche and just something we say, we don't really think about. Kind of like the hymns in the hymn book. Uh, we sing them frequently. And after a while, you get to where you're not even really paying attention to what they're saying. You're just singing it because it's there. And sometimes with scripture that's familiar, um, we can just get to where um, we, we, we will criticize uh, other religions and denominations for um, traditions and for saying things in rote memory, but then sometimes we as Christians do the same thing. Things like with what they call the Lord's Prayer. I like to call it the model prayer, but people just quote it and they're not even really thinking about it. Uh, same thing with Psalm 23. It's so familiar that sometimes we just say it, but we're not really thinking about it. John 3, 16. We say it so much, and we're no longer really letting it sink in but the Word of God ought to be special to us no matter how many times the passage is preached, no matter how many times it's talked about. And Psalm 23 has been giving people comfort for a long time. A long time. And I want to look at this as we look at this together, Psalm 23, starting at verse 1. The Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Help us, Lord, as we look into this familiar passage. Help it to be an encouragement to somebody's heart, to be a blessing to somebody, to, to lift them up and to help them and to challenge us to look at you as our great shepherd. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And amen. It is an interesting thing um, when you study the scriptures. There's a passage of scripture in the New Testament that talks about the shepherd and the sheep. Uh, and it and talks there about how the sheep know his voice. Uh, that the thief wants to break in to steal and to kill and to destroy. But that the sheep hear his voice. This world wants to believe that everybody um, is of God and that everybody is either his child or one of his sheep. Uh, and that is not the case. 
Um, the Bible says that his sheep hear his voice or know his voice. That means there are others that do not know his voice. There are those that are outside of his sheep fold. Uh, not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone is one of his sheep. But if you're saved by the blood of Christ, if you're washed in that precious blood, if you are gloriously saved and on your way to heaven, you have the great privilege of being one of the Lord's sheep. You have the privilege of having him as your shepherd, as your shepherd. Now, there's something very interesting. Uh, Jesus Christ has his sheep. Uh, what he does not have in his kingdom or should not have in his kingdom, he does not have wild sheep. Sheep that are off on their own. Sheep that just don't belong to anybody. You know, there are sheep that don't belong to anybody, right? They're wild. They're in the mountains. They're hanging off the side of cliffs. You ever seen those pictures of them hanging off the side of cliffs? And, and they're all those things. But they don't belong to anybody. As a Christian, you need to realize I belong to a shepherd. I belong to a shepherd. We want to act like we're our own shepherd. But you belong to the shepherd. You belong to him. And you can say, as David did, the Lord is my shepherd. Something that I love about the Bible is this. Many books, most books, either talk in past or future. They talk about the past or they talk about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but the Word of God is a book that talks in past, present, and future. You can read this just as much as when David wrote this down. You can apply this to yourself just as much as it was relevant in his day. It's still in the present tense in this day. That's an amazing thing. This is a book. The Word of God is a book that every generation that has ever been or ever will be can read it and it will be for that day in the present tense. So just as David said, the Lord is my shepherd, you can say the Lord is my shepherd. Right this minute, if you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you can say the Lord is my shepherd. And then I love what it says next. It says, I shall not want. Now we sit there and we look at that through our human lens. And we sit there and go, oh, there's been times when I wanted a lot of things. You see, our flesh desires many things. Our flesh is always wanting something. You ever notice how hard it is to please your flesh? Uh, anybody here eat a good supper? Anybody eat a good supper? Are you going to eat one when you go home? Some people eat after church. Uh, or maybe you ate before and after. Uh, but uh, you ate good today? Anybody ate good today? You ever notice that your flesh is not satisfied with that? You ever notice that tomorrow, you know what you're going to want to do? Boy, that meal yesterday was so great. I don't even need anything today. Yeah, right. I remember I was laughing. I was down in Mexico and we were sitting at breakfast. This is back when I was getting to know, before I was married, I was getting to know my wife. And, and we're sitting at breakfast and, and we're eating the breakfast and we're eating away at the breakfast. And, 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 and my, what's now my father-in-law, my father-in-law looked up and said, okay, and what are we having for lunch? You know, as we're eating breakfast, any of you ladies give testimony to that? As you're serving them one meal, they're asking what's for the next meal? Uh-huh. I've been there. So what are we going to have for supper? Uh, you know, man, that's a great taco, but what are we going to have for supper? Uh, you know, it, the flesh is never satisfied. And so if you look at this through the eyes of flesh, you're going to go, wait a minute. I want things all the time. I want more money. I want a nicer house, I want a better car, I want this, I want that. The flesh is really never satisfied. As much as you try to please your flesh, it'll always want something. It'll always want something. It's amazing how people that have money, they just keep trying to get what? More money, right? Never satisfied. Just want more, more and more and more. 
And this flesh will not be pleased. But what you can be is you can be content and you can be satisfied spiritually. I, what did Paul say? I have learned and whatsoever state I am therewith to be what? Content. Content. There's an old saying, the grass may be greener on the other side, but sometimes it's poison ivy. You know, but what, isn't that how we are as humans? We're constantly, we, God blesses us with us, this, and what are we always doing? Looking around to see what else we don't have, right? It's amazing with kids. You can, get, you can give kid, a kid a brand new toy, and the other kid will be playing with something, and they'll want that toy instead of what they're playing with because we're always looking we're never satisfied in the flesh we're never content in the flesh but when you make the lord your shepherd and when you allow him to shepherd you and you begin to realize that he knows what is best and what he is doing is best you will learn to abound and to be abased but in everything to be what content that's the thing, when you are allowing God, uh, by the way, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to bring this flesh into subjection. But spiritually, God wants to satisfy you. Spiritually, God doesn't want to satisfy every one of your fleshly desires. God doesn't want to do that because he knows that's not good for you. That's not good for you. Kids always want something right they always want something you go to take them to the store and there is 18 things that they want there's a reason why they put all the candy and the little toys and all of that stuff right at the cash register you know why right well for people that like sweets like me ah uh, hey, remember the right hey, you know, those Reese's look really good when you're walking through right here yeah, those things but, uh, but also because they know the kids. Kids, mom, mom. And every time you go to the store, mom, mom, can I get this? Mom, mom, no, no, put it back, put it back. They just keep bringing more stuff. Put it back, put it back, put it back. Kids are uh, 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 just not satisfied. They always want something more. But you as a parent know that giving them everything isn't good for them. Makes them selfish. Can make them overweight. It's this, it's, it's not good to satisfy every desire that a child has. And you know what God knows? God knows that your flesh, it's not good to please your flesh all the time. It's not good to give you everything. But when you begin to allow him to be your shepherd, then you can learn to be content with what he gives you. And that is an area, I, I th I've always been amazed by that verse where the Apostle Paul, who we think of as one of the most amazing Christians to ever live, right? One of the greatest missionaries. We, we think of the Apostle Paul, we hold him in high esteem. And yet even he said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. That means that the Apostle Paul wasn't always content either. But he learned as he allowed the shepherd to have more control of his life, he began to learn that there are things more pleasing than giving your flesh everything it wants. The spirit, the spiritual is more important than the fleshly. And so why is it that Christians are not content in this day and age? Could it be that's because we're not content with what the shepherd is doing and where he is taking us? But as we begin to allow him to take his rightful place as shepherd of our life and submit ourselves to him and put ourselves under his care and put ourselves under his guidance and under his protection, what God begins to do is he will change your desires. Do you know God changes your desires? Before you got saved, you had different desires than you have right now, right? Most of us didn't. Before we were saved, most of us didn't want to come to church all the time. Most of us didn't like singing the, 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 the hymns. 
Most of us, I, you don't know, I, I've talked to many people who said things like this. You know, before I got saved, I didn't even like church people. Now I love them. Now I wouldn't want to be around anybody else. I didn't even like them before I got saved. You know, God changes our life. We are new creatures, right? And part of that is also changing our thinking and our desires and what we consider having what we want. What God changes is our wants. Our wants. I remember listening to a testimony of a, a, a lady who's crippled and, and people were saying, you know, she said that people many times would ask her, oh, I bet you can't wait till you get to heaven so that you can walk and that you can. And she said, it's a lot more than that. So I can't wait to get to heaven to be free of this body of sin. I can't wait to get to heaven to be free from this, from this flesh and these things. We, we focus so much on the physical. And what we ought to do is allow God to be our shepherd and begin to change our desires and our wants. And as you become more spiritual and as you become more in tune with God, the things that will please you more are the things of God. Then you too can say like David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We always look at that as always the physical, right? But there were times when the Apostle Paul didn't have anything to eat. There were times when the Apostle Paul was stripped naked. There was times when the Bible says he was abounded and there were other times when he was abased. We look at it always as the physical. You realize that one of the stories that's used to preach about the gospel, uh, 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 one, of the, one of the biggest stories to be preached about the gospel is uh, uh, Lazarus and the rich man. We use that all the time, right? We talk about Lazarus and rich, but we're going to preach on hell. Most of the time, that's where we turn, right? There are other passages, but most of the time, that's where we start out is with Lazarus and the rich man. You realize that Lazarus nowadays wouldn't be considered a good Christian? He wasn't, but he wasn't, he wasn't blessed with God. He was a beggar. That doesn't sound... You don't think that he had fleshly wants? You don't think that he desired? You, you think he wanted to live with those sores? You think he wanted to live in poverty like that? You think he wanted to have to beg for bread? We're so wrapped up in, in fleshly and earthly blessings that we forget that many times what God wants to do is change what we want. And what we ought to desire more, didn't the Lord Jesus tell his disciples there's more than bread? Did we not sing it tonight? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Didn't the Lord Jesus, didn't he tell his disciples when they were trying to get him to eat? Remember when he was trying to get him to eat? He says, I have bread that you know not of. What was more important to Jesus Christ? Being about his father's business. They said a praying hide that many times they would have to come in and they would have to almost force him to eat because he would get so wrapped up in his prayer that he'd forget. He'd get so wrapped up in the spiritual that he would forget. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing that God has blessed us physically. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm grateful for a nice home and good food and, and nice clothes and air conditioning and heat. And I'm grateful for all of that. But if that's all that we're looking for as God supplying our need, we miss the spiritual. The Lord is our shepherd, but he's not just our shepherd in the flesh. He's our shepherd spiritually. And you could be hungry in the flesh and satisfied in the spirit. You think about those Christians who were, uh, 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 Persecuted behind the iron curtain. Do you think they had everything that their flesh desired? They were beaten. They were thrown in cold, nasty cells. They were, they were uh, 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 dressed in rags. They were given horrible food. They were, they, they, in the flesh you would go, they had a lot of things that they could, they, they, they desired. But there were people that were satisfied in Christ. People that were satisfied in Christ.
I wonder how many of us would rather have a full belly than have the power of Paul to shake off a snake into the fire and not be harmed. Shipwrecked, wet, out in the cold. Yes, the, 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 the neighbors were bringing him stuff, but they were cold, wet, shipwrecked. He was a prisoner. I mean, he was, it wasn't, it was down the road. They were going to chop his head off. I mean, he was, he was, he, and yet in the middle of all of that, Paul was calm and Paul shook off a snake into the fire. Would we rather have a full belly or the power of God like Paul had? Would we rather be sitting in comfort or have the power of God like Paul had? I think we need to examine our wants. And what we should want is all of Christ. What we should want is to be filled with the Spirit. What we should want is the bread, this bread. What we should want is even if we don't have everything that we want physically, if we are completely satisfied spiritually, you can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse 2, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Once again, as American Christians, we can apply everything to the physical. But you know what's amazing to me in American Christianity? We have everything physically that we could really want. I mean, we have everything. The poorest of the poor in the United States. I mean, what we consider poor in the United States in many countries is middle class. Have you ever seen the income level that is considered poverty level in the United States? I mean, there's, there's, there's middle class to, to middle upper class in other countries that would dream of having that salary. We are... We are, uh, we, we become so, we have everything we want physically. And yet, American Christians are so dissatisfied. We're so dissatisfied. Constantly have to be propped up, constantly have to be encouraged, constantly have to be, and, and woe is us, and Look, folks, I'm not minimizing anyone that suffered through this pandemic at all. And I, I'm not talking about the, those that have gotten sick and those that have passed away and, and the grief that people have had. I'm, that's not the area I'm talking about tonight. But talking about physically, we have not suffered physically. Food, money, clothes, homes, we've had in the United States of America... When it comes to the physical side of things, we've done pretty well. We've done pretty well. But yet, it's amazing. We have everything that our heart could almost desire. And yet, American Christians are so dissatisfied. We have it all in many ways, and yet we act as if we're underprivileged. Because our thinking is wrong. We're focusing so much on the physical and on the material and on the worldly that we're missing the point. What God wants to do is satisfy us spiritually. He wants you to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. You think about those still waters and those green pastures. Yes, that can be talking about physical things, but more than that, I think, I think of, of the disquiet that's in people's souls. The disquiet that's in people's lives. And in, in, with my son, we're involved with the medical community a lot and, and different people uh, in the medical community. And it's amazing. They all have big houses and fancy cars and dead up to here, but they got, they got all the nice things and they, they've, they've got, they can buy things and they can go on vacations and they can do all of these things. 
and yet they're miserable and disquieted. We have so much materially, but we act like our pastures are dried up. You know why? Focusing on the wrong thing. Focusing on the wrong thing. What matters more than the physical is the spiritual. And you know what God wants to do? He wants to give you green pastures. Green pastures. He wants to feed your soul. He wants to give you of the best of the best. What does a prophet of man if he gain the whole world and lose what? His own soul. We're focused so much on the, on the world that we're missing out on. We need to be feeding our soul. God wants to take you and put you in the green pastures of our soul, of your soul. He wants this word to become rich to you. That's why he says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And the more as you see the day coming, why he knows how dry the soul can get in this world. But what he wants to do is take the Christian and give them the green pastures of his word, the green pastures of his will, the green pastures of, 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 the, uh, of the church of God. God has, still has green pastures he wants us to lie down in. Why, we're in such a hurry. We just get into our Bible reading and it's just how quickly can we get done because we got a busy day. You know what God wants to do you to do sometimes? Just lie down there in those green pastures. Come to church and we just we go we want it to be timed and down to the minute and and he's running longer than he normally goes and da 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 and that, that this service is going too long and and why are we singing another song and and we got it we're just impatient and impatient and patient. You know what God wants to do sometimes? Just set you down in those green pastures and let you feed. But we got to get our eyes off of the feeding of the flesh. And get on the feeding of the Spirit. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Um, I've had an opportunities, opportunities through my life to, my parents, we went camping a few times and we've had opportunities to, to be around bodies of water. And um, I've been next to the ocean when it's pretty calm, I've been next to the ocean when it's pretty riled up. Uh, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been by waters that are rushing pretty fast. I've been by some pools that are pretty calm. You know, there's just something calming about still waters. I'm not talking about stagnant waters. <laughs> you ever been by those where it's just stagnant and it smells? But I'm talking about this, just those calm waters. Those calm waters. You know, it's interesting that they'll, they'll put music and then they'll put behind it like bubbling water and calm water or soft rain or something calming about all of that you know what god wants to do he wants to calm your soul he wants to calm your soul we're in such turmoil such chaos it's amazing to me this in 2020 how and, and by the way we all did it we all complained right we all moaned and we all uh, you know, uh, we did all of that, but it's amazing to me how in turmoil the soul of Christians is. I don't like the way things are going in our country. I don't. But you know what we've allowed it to do? Affect our spirit and our soul. You know what God wants to do? Lead you beside those still waters. He wants to bring calmness calmness sister Monita I'll always remember 2008 the first year that y'all were here and Hurricane, Hurricane Dolly came and uh, y'all were living in Raymondville and uh, it was a Wednesday if y'all remember it was a Wednesday and so mid afternoon I don't know it was about 4 o'clock or so I got a call from Brother Brown and uh, he says Brother Matter, we're going to have service tonight I'm sitting here and it's just whipping and whipping and whipping around and electricity's off and I'm going, why would he ask that question? And I went, oh, Brother Brown? Um, what's the weather like where you are right now? He says, it's very calm. I said, oh, brother, you're in the eye. 
give it a little while. Sure enough, I think he called me back about a half an hour later and said, and I told him, I said, don't try to get here. <laughs> brother Brown would have tried, you know. And, and I remember, he, I remember later, I think he called me a little bit later and said, yeah, brother, it's, 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 it's going crazy again. You know what God wants to do? Set us down in the eye of that storm. Just keep us there beside the still water. You know the storm's going to still be raging. You know the storms of life are going to rage until you either pass away or he comes back, right? There's always going to be storms in life. But you know what he wants to do in the middle of that storm? Put you beside that still water. And I'm not talking about physically because we all have to face storms, right? But you know what he wants to do? He wants to put that peace down here. He wants to put that calmness in your heart, that calmness in your mind, that calmness in your spirit. He's your shepherd. He wants to meet every need that you have spiritually. And by the way, he'll take care of your physical needs too. But he won't take care of all of your physical wants. But he will take care of your physical needs. But he wants to take care of you spiritually so that you are content and have no wants. Not only that, but he will make you to lie down in green pastures Sometimes as Christians, we need to slow our minds down and focus on the word and, and just let ourselves soak in the word. I think of the story of Mary and Martha. There was nothing wrong with Martha serving. Doesn't the Bible talk about us serving? Doesn't the Bible talk about us being co-laborers and working hard and doing those things? The Bible's real study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We ought to be busy serving. Doesn't, doesn't the Bible call us servants of God? So the problem wasn't Martha serving. The problem was she wasn't taking any time like Mary to sit in the green pastures. He wants to take us and feed our soul till we have no want. He wants us to just lie down in those green pastures and feast. Many Christians have everything they want physically, but they're a dry desert spiritually. And he doesn't want you to be a dry desert spiritually. He wants you to lay down in the green pastures. He wants to calm your soul and calm your heart and give you peace. Are the fruit of the Spirit love, joy, peace? Or are the fruit of the Spirit hate, anxiety, and unhappiness. It's love, joy, peace, right? Love, joy, peace. Doesn't the Bible talk about the peace of God which passeth all understanding? We, we've got to get over going into hysterics and panic and letting our soul be disturbed every time the world is. Because as we get closer to the end, there's going to be more disturbances, folks. There's going to be more turmoil. You really think it's going to get better? No, there's going to be more chaos, more turmoil, more problems, more stress, more tribulation, more persecution, more problems. And what are we as Christians going to do? Panic like the world? Or are we going to let God lay us down in those green pastures and put us beside those still waters. There may be chaos on the outside, but you don't have to always have chaos on the inside, folks. Because God wants to lay you down and lead you beside the still waters. And look what it says. He restoreth my soul. He restoreth my soul. If you're going to restore something, that means that you think of uh, uh, these folks that restore old cars and they'll take an old car. And, and I remember years ago, I was uh, in, in north of Houston at a church for a summer and the pastor there, that was something that he did. He would, it was a way that he helped supplement his income. He would actually restore cars and then he would, uh, uh, and then he would sell them. And he had, uh, I think it was a 1969 Nova, I think is what he had. And they restored this thing, fire engine red. I mean, this thing, 
Uh, for guys that know cars, I don't know that much about it, but it had a big block in it. So when you sat in it, it just went, oh, you know, this, this car was amazing. And, uh, but he showed me pictures of when he first started. And it sure didn't look like the end product. It was pretty rusty and pretty broken down. And, you know, I think a lot of Christians have kind of let their soul and their spirit get kind of rusty and run down and beat up. And You know what God wants to do? Restore it. Have you ever seen one of those cars that's been taken from rust to mint condition again? That's what God wants to do with you. I know it's been hard. I know it's been a struggle. I, I know that there's been problems and, and, and disappointments. And I know that the last uh, uh, year or so it, for globally has been crazy and chaotic. And, and I know that a lot of Christians have allowed their soul to just get kind of beat up and, and, and run down. And, 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 but I'm here to tell you that if you will allow your shepherd to have control and to guide you, what he will do is take your soul and restore it. David, when he fell into sin, he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He missed that inner peace, a restored soul. I understand we get, we get a, a, a saved soul when we get saved, right? It's saved. But boy, we can sure let this world affect us internally. Our thinking, our, our actions, our heart, our our attitude, and, and, and what we as Christians need to do is say, you know what, God, I'm tired of the world affecting me. I'm tired of everything that's going on affecting me. I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of being angry. I'm tired of being down. I'm tired of all of that. You know what some of us need? We just need God to restore us. Restore us. The psalmist said he'll do it. Do you believe that uh, what we're reading tonight is inspired? Believe it's inspired by God? So that if he says that he will restore our soul, you know what that means, right? He will restore our soul. Christians, we, of all people, should be the calmest, the most at peace, and should have a soul restored our spirit within us the spirit within us doesn't have to be beat up and torn down and 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 put up on blocks and rusted out we could have a renewed and restored soul and renewed and restored spirit christian don't let the world pull you down let the shepherd restore your soul he restoreth my soul then he says, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here is what all of that beginning work. If you really look at the beginning work, you see that he is preparing us for our journey. He's taking care of our wants spiritually. He's lying us down in green pastures. He's leading us beside the still waters. He's restoring our soul. Why? Because he's going to take us on a journey. I used to enjoy reading Westerns. And um, when you read rest Westerns, you, you'd read books and you'd read about those cattle drives. You know, it's one of the things that they would do. One of the things that they would do in those cattle drives is before they were going to take them on that long journey, They'd put them in some good pasture to get them fattened up. Because they knew on that journey, there was going to be a lot of walking. There was going to be times that were going to go be, be going through areas where there was not water, where there was not uh, uh, food, where the grass was going to be sparse. And those cattle were going to need that strength for their journey. 
And I think a lot of Christians are stumbling and falling on the journey because they're trying to walk the journey without a restored soul. They're trying to walk the journey without being full of the green pasture. They're trying to walk the journey without having a soul that's at peace. They're trying to walk that journey desiring all that the world has to offer. And you learn something about this world that doesn't satisfy. But when you are going down the journey of life and you are satisfied with what God has given you and you are satisfied in your soul and you have been fed in the green pastures and you have sat and laid down by those still waters and your soul is at peace with God, you can handle the journey better. Yea, he says, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. And it's all for his name's sake. When um, they talk about a sheep herd, you know who should get the glory in a sheep herd? The shepherd. Sheep didn't really do anything. You know, sheep are not very smart animals, right? They're not very smart. They're very easily scared. They're very easily drawn away. They, they're very, pretty much defenseless. Um, they'll wander off and fall off a cliff. You know, they're not the smartest men. I'm talking about the domesticated sheep, the sheep that are for wool, those types of things. They're not the, the, the smartest things, smartest animals. Uh, by the way, we got this little picture of the, you know, the, the, what's that mattress company that has a nice little cute little white sheep. Uh, yeah, you ever seen sheep that have been out in the wild for a while? They smell, they're beat up, they're matted, their fur's all matted. Sheep are not, they, sheep, I'm not talking about the mountain goats and the mountain sheep. I'm talking about domesticated sheep. They don't do that well on their own. That's why they need a shepherd. And depending on how good the shepherd is, is how good the flock is going to do. And you know who should get the glory for the sheep? The shepherd. And you know who deserves to get glory in our life? The shepherd. He's the one that satisfies the soul. He's the one that supplies all your need. He's the one that uh, 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 feeds you spiritually. He's the one that will calm your soul and give you peace within and as we are walking down the path of righteousness, which he is leading us in, he should be the one getting the glory. He should be the one getting the glory. I'm not talking tonight about the physical. I'm talking about spiritually. Has he satisfied your soul? Have you been lying down in those green pastures? How about your inner spirit? Is it in turmoil? Or is it laying by those still waters? Has he restored your soul that has gotten kind of beat up and down and discouraged? Maybe that's why you're having a hard time walking down the path of righteousness. Because you haven't let God do that inner work that he wants to do. And maybe that's why his name isn't being glorified in our lives the way it should. The Lord is my shepherd. He is yours also. But the question is, are you submitted to him completely? as the shepherd. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. Lord, I believe there's some folks who have gone their own way and running their own lives. And Lord, as Christians, the best place to be is under your leadership as the shepherd. Lord, I pray that if there's some people here that have some spiritual wants, that they would be satisfied tonight. I pray, Lord, that if there's some people here who are hungry, the Bible says, Lord, that if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we would be filled. And Lord, I pray you take us into those green pastures. 
I pray if there's people here who uh, or are watching whose soul or their, their spirit is, is in turmoil, that, Lord, they would turn to you and allow you to lead them to the still waters. And I pray if there are people who have allowed this world and the things of this world to bring their soul down, that tonight would be the night of restoration so that we could walk the path of righteousness, and your name would be glorified and honored. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's all stand together. The Lord spoke to your heart. You just need to talk to the shepherd. Maybe you just need to talk to the shepherd tonight. I don't know. But let's all stand together and turn if you would. And um, uh, let me find the number. Um, we're going to do in Shady Green Pastures. Um, let me find that for you, that one. God leads us along. Page number 488. Let's sing that one tonight. Page number 488. 488. In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children Along where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Amen. We're going to go into our time of prayer. So y'all may be seated. So we're going to say goodbye to Facebook land and we're going to go into a time of prayer here in the church.